Alex Merle. when it was common for airships and blimps to fill the skies of America and Europe. And more than 75 years later, Bill Whitaker shows us why airships could be taking off again. The submarine-style airship is called Aeroscraft, and it's being housed at the Tustin Marine Corps Air Station. The workers are putting together a completely new kind of aircraft, a kind of aircraft the world has never seen. It looks like a blimp, but its designers say it's a whole lot more, that it might be the future of air travel. What's different this time is it's helium, and they've created something here that entirely new altogether. A vehicle that could take humanitarian aid, military missions, and shipping logistics to new heights. This could be vital in helping troops in remote areas overseas. I've never seen anything that looks like this. There isn't one. This is the only one in the world. There is no place that this vehicle can't go. We can go anywhere. There's no ports, no runways. It could be the rainforest. It could be the Arctic. We can land on snow, ice, water. It could be like an air cruise ship. You can go around the world and just kind of hover over Italy, for example, drop down and go see part of Paris or Rome or wherever. You really don't know what it's going to be used for because of our Great. Thank you, everybody. I know I'm keeping us from lunch, so I'll keep this interesting and hopefully not too long. So my name is Alex Merle, VP of Strategic Partnerships for Eros. Uh, it, the talk was supposed to be given by the founder and CEO. Unfortunately, he had some meetings in DC that came up last minute that he needed to attend. So I thought I'd speak positively of him and, and actually let the LA Times do that um, for me. So this quote, and I think if you read the quote, I won't read it all to you except for the bottom. He was unstoppable. This is from the FAA. Uh, Igor is, uh, like me, Ukrainian-American. He was born there. I was born here. Uh, but he immigrated here in 1994, but founded his first airship company in 1987 um, in what was then Soviet Ukraine. So talk about having a lifelong passion for something. You know, Igor has had that. And as I've been sitting here listening to the other presenters, it, one of the things that really struck me was this idea, well, what will AI do for other industries and for people? And I think one of the things that has been a theme is it'll supercharge innovators and innovation because it gives you the tools to do even more. And one thing you can't take away is you can't take away that human element because it's the human element that drives and wants to continue and doesn't give up and continues to strive to make things in the world better. Uh, and people like Igor uh, can do that in their sectors, whatever that sector might be. If you're an author, if you're an innovator, or if you just really want to make airships, um, which is much harder than it might sound like because people sort of think of the Zeppelin. And we'll get into some of those topics here. But um, I think Igor is an example of what AI can do and you know, how does AI factor into what we're doing. And it's similar to some of the comments with GE. It's really ancillary or secondary, but it helps do with things like routing. And I have a slide on, on, on some of the specific examples. But the airship is so big, it also acts like a flying hub. So you'll be able to do all the things in a warehouse in the sky and uh, hopefully decarbonize in, in, in the process. So anyway, this slide um, sort of tees up what Eros is. Uh, a few other data points. I don't have slides on them, but I think they're important to, to highlight. So Igor came here, this was um, around 2000, got this FAA type certification for different airships, then went on to receive significant funding from the US government. One of the people you saw in the, uh, the video was Dr. Anthony Tether, so he was the former director of DARPA, he's part of the team. I'll actually be meeting with Dr. Tether in DC on Wednesday. So funding from NASA, DOE, um, DARPA, um, and, other, uh, and the DOD led to the critical innovations that then made the airship Aeros Aeroscraft possible. The most important innovation, because there's other competitors like this in this space, in fact, one just started flying up in, uh, in uh, the, the, the Bay Area, founded by Sergey Brin, which is LTA, but that's a lighter than aircraft, uh, as the acronym suggests. Um, and the difference here is this is not. So the key innovation that came out of the DARPA and other uh, funding projects was control of static heaviness. So if you think of the airship as a, a submarine that's moving through the air, um, and I got a quote here, moving goods through the ocean of the air and ports are everywhere is the basic dream that Igor has. Uh, we're constricted by ports and other um, physical infrastructure. Today, one of the biggest issues that that creates is uh, carbonization. So there's a lot of trucks in the United States in particular that we rely on getting goods from point A to point B. Um, with the aeroscraft, a few things have happened that will allow us to tackle that. Um, the, the, the version of the craft that you saw was powered by diesel um, and then traditional turbines. Uh, what we're switching to is hydrogen, and that's not an innovation that we came up with. In parallel to the aeroscraft's development, there's been two key innovations that will, I think, supercharge our ability to not just serve 
uh, customers and clients getting cargo from point A to point B, but also decarbonizing in the process. And one of those is hydrogen fuel cells and powertrains, which are now more or less commercially off the shelf available. There's a lot happening in automotive, uh, companies like Ballard with trucks. You can buy a Toyota Mirai and drive it around. One of the constraints and bottlenecks is the infrastructure um, to fuel them, uh, which again is a little bit easier if you have a fixed point like we would from a base of operations. But even there, uh, the availability of fuel, but one of the things the IRA is doing, and again in parallel innovation, is to try to try to supercharge that with funding, giving you $3 per kilogram for green hydrogen. So we expect there'll be a lot of green hydrogen development. And one thing that I'll let you do, so that's the first ch check, zero. Uh, zero emissions. Global reach, um, we'll be using modular containerized um, fuel, cell, um, fuel cells. So you can either load them in the 66 ton capacity for the shift if you need a longer flight, or you can pick them up en route, giving you effectively unlimited reach, constrained mostly by, uh, uh, by flying time uh, of the pilots. But you can also pick up and drop off pilots as you're going. Uh, pick up and drop off cargo from a hover. The, the control of static heaviness allows you to hover and land vertically or take off vertically. Um, and by doing that, you really can have uh, flexible routes, as which is where the AI comes in in, in one of the four forthcoming slides. Okay, here are some basic characteristics of the one on the left will be the first one that we're developing, including a smaller, uh, smaller test ship. The one on the right is uh, some years away, but 66 kilogram capacity, 120 uh, miles per hour, uh, 3,100 mile uh, reach. Again, you can extend that by having more fuel tanks and then an 8,800 square foot uh, cargo bay capacity, which also goes vertically up 30 feet. So it's actually 264,000 cubic feet. So you can do things like store larger uh, pieces of cargo. Uh, for example, wind turbines. We were talking about turbines and electrical grid equipment in the last slide. So getting that from point A to point B, um, one of the things, actually the biggest constraints, for example, in the wind turbine industry is actually the size of these things and getting them on, on the roads. Um, so I, I saw a recent example in Germany where it took them nine months to get permitting to get the, tur the largest uh, turbine blades from the port to the final destination precisely because you have to stop traffic, figure out and calculate whether you can make a turn. But if you have a flying hub or something that can carry significant amounts of cargo from point A to point B, those issues um, go away. Um, Fine, here's the, the, the slide that I think makes clear how we're going to be using AI uh, in one of the ways and why it's important. Today, in less than truckload shipping, which is driven by all our Amazon consumerism, uh, it's really been taking over and COVID just accelerated the process where we're just expecting to get small packages um, to our homes whenever we want them or whenever we need them. Very often those packages uh, everyone's experienced this. It might be a very big box with a very small thing, like a toothbrush inside of it, um, which I know Amazon is trying to do a better job of. But it's driving the amount of trucks on the road. And on this slide, you can see, you know, four million, four and a half million, approximately, fleet of semi-tractor trailers in the United States, um, three million on the road every day, massive source of carbon emissions. And they're also not taking efficient routes because what people used to do Full truckload shipping, you know, Toys R Us and a truckload of Barbies going from one place to another. Um, today, it's quite different. You have small shipments that are going from different places and they're moved from one distribution center to another just distribution center, reloaded, repackaged. That's why sometimes when you get your, uh, and this is a silly thing, I do it too, your laundry detergent from Amazon, it's broken and spilled all over the box and you know, covered all the other things. And their customer service is great. They just send it back and pay you back or you know, let you reorder it. But that leads to, again, massive carbonization, massive inefficiencies, destruction of products very often and damage of products. And what you can do if your flying hub is an airship or if you're flying warehouse, you can move in different ways. Now initially, and we're working with US government stakeholders um, on this as well, but initially we'll be focused on um, some easy routes. So for example, like Laredo, Texas to Detroit, uh, massive amounts of trucks and carports just doing that route every single day. Even closer to home, we're a California, Los Angeles-based company, and uh, the, the manufacturing facilities will either be in Southern California or Nevada. We're in discussions with both. Um, but the port of Los Angeles, so Long Beach and LA, 19 million 20-foot equi container equivalents every year coming into that port. Most of them go not very far uh, to San, Bern San Bernardino and uh, Ontario, where there's huge Huge isn't the right word. Just a massive amounts of uh, distribution centers. Then from there, they go to other places. So simply focusing on doing that more efficiently can remove up to 43, th there's 43,000 trucks on the road as a result moving from LA uh, to San Bernardino and then other places like Phoenix and Nevada. So that'll be a hub for us. 
and then hopefully we'll expand nationally. As we expand nationally and start doing things that replace less than truckload shipping, the routing will become important. Um, and AI can help in that by optimizing it. We're working with a company, well actually uh, former employees of a company, um, that have a lot of expertise in pricing the economics of a system and then uh, adapting the routing for that. Um, and they're working on an autonomous mobility solution together with, uh, I also happen to be Ukrainian American, together with the government of Ukraine in the, pro in the process of their reconstruction to use Ukraine as a test bed for an autonomous mobility solution that prices the network and prices the, um, the cost of operating that network and we think that's something that would work well with our airships um, and we're in discussions with them to figure out how to work together. But again, all of this routing becomes possible and will be made more efficient by AI in addition to all these other things that you see listed here including weather was mentioned yesterday, so there's supercomputing that's doing a better job with weather. Um, in a lot of these instances, we won't need to invent on our own. We'll just partner with companies that are doing a good job and ground groundbreaking work and research on these issues on their own, and then apply them to um, the flying hub, the aeroscraft, which again, one of the key benefits of which will be not just getting your packages faster, but hopefully decarbonizing the, um, the economy, which is a major priority of the Biden administration and others. So on the last slide here, you'll see the results. What we're aiming for is next day uh, shipping, next day air at ground shipping prices. You know, approximately uh, the, the operating cost for a, an aeroscraft is about $2,000 per block hour, 16 block hours in a day. And each craft can take about the equivalent of 400 trucks from the road. So I think all in all, it's a big dream. It's a dream that will be helped uh, along the way by AI uh, in, in some specific ways on the previous slide, which were listed. Um, but uh, we're really excited about the work that's happening and at the core you have an inventor, an innovator whose work is going to be supercharged and made easier by the technologies that other people have developed including um, artificial intelligence. So I think we probably have a few minutes left um, and if anybody has any questions I can field those. Otherwise I, uh, I look forward to seeing you all at lunch and we can discuss there. <laughs>